Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to our social work coffee break. Uh, it's a fortnightly, fortnightly learning opportunity for social workers like yourselves uh, to join in a practice led discussion. It's every other Wednesday at 11 a.m. So, um, and we're looking, we've invited frontline fellows to share their research with you. And today we have uh, David Wilson. This is episode four of series four um, of the Frontline um, Coffee Break series. And David um, Wilson is from our 2020 cohort. Um, so my name is Oli Chima. I am a social worker and a member of the curriculum team at Frontline. And my job here is curating and designing content for delivery and sometimes delivering. Um, the session is going to be recorded. So we'll have a five minute introduction. Uh, David will speak for 15 minutes and present his work, which today is on language and social work. And um, then there'll be a 10 minute uh, Q&A at the end, which I will facilitate. Uh, if you have questions while you're listening, please feel free to put the questions in the chat so that I can signpost David uh, uh, to the questions at the end in the 10 minutes. Um, yeah, David has been at the Frontline program for over two years. He's just completed his a AS AYSC and he's working in the London Borough of Tower Hamlets in the Family Support and Protection team. And prior to becoming uh, a social worker through Frontline, he did 10 years in PR and corporate communications. So um, I'd just like to thank you very much for joining us. Um, bear in mind the session is going to be recorded, so it'd be great if you can have your cameras on. And um, yeah, I'm going to hand over to David. Uh, David Wilson, take it away. OK, thank you very much. Right, I need to um, share my slides, which I just practiced, so it will definitely go well. OK. Uh, so I hope everybody can see that. Good, OK, brilliant. Thank you very much. Thanks for the intro, Ole. Um, so I... Um, uh, I've just well a couple of months ago I submitted uh, my master's dissertation um, for the frontline program um, and it was about language in social work and um, this is the very first time I've ever presented on it so I hope this is a good and interesting presentation like there's a there's a the frontline dissertation or any kind of master's dissertation as I'm sure lots of you know is absolutely enormous and I've tried to kind of condense this down into something that hopefully will be interesting and quite practical. Um, you can let me know at the end uh, whether it's whether it's been any use. Um, so I think um, there are, um, I think we can all think of times when the language we use has has failed to communicate what we mean. Or indeed, when we've when we've seen that happen, when when other people have been trying to communicate something, and, and for some reason the language they're using isn't working, um, and this is a this is a problem in social work. I think everyone recognises this. So there's a lot of uh, language that's used by us and by other professionals that excludes people. So you know, when I, whenever I talk about this dissertation language in social work, people always mention jargon. People always talk about how they've sat in a meeting and somebody's been talking about the lado or a CP chair or a sin plan, and the the family that's in that meeting as well has no idea what's what's going on. Um, but it's not just. I don't want this. Isn't just about jargon. Jargon isn't a very big part of it. I, I think even really simple language, really plain everyday language, can also. Um, fail to convey meaning and a, a little story about that I remember a um a sin meeting a child in need meeting I sat in um where a teacher was talking about this um this young boy's bad behavior at school and that was the that was the phrase he used bad behavior um it's a really simple phrase but in the context of a child in need meeting you know I'm thinking that's something quite severe right we're we're here because there's a social worker involved and mum's been called into a meeting to talk about it. And I asked the teacher, well, you know, you say he's bad behaviour, what, what do you mean? And he said, well, there was a time when he was rolling on the carpet in class and also he doesn't listen to his teacher very much. And we got into a conversation about how, you know, that's really not outside of the realms of, um, of normal behaviour for an eight year old. Um, Mum had been quite scared when she first heard about this bad behaviour, but when we actually explored what that that really simple phrase mean, 
or what it what it meant um if she was calmer and we were able to have a much more productive discussion so there are all these kind of ways where if we don't get into language and we don't really interrogate interrogate what it means we we create problems for ourselves um i think there are it also works the other way around it's not language isn't just a way of finding out information i think if we use language better as social workers it can help create change and that's something i'm going to um come on to talk about a little bit later in the presentation um i want to talk about um a philosopher ludwig wittgenstein um he was around in the kind of early part of the last century um and he talked a lot about language um and one of his big ideas was that language can't be understood if we don't understand the context that that language is used in um and he when he was talking about uh, he was talking about kind of context creating meaning and he's not just talking about sort of it, like esoteric or fluffy terms he's not talking about like understanding the meaning of something like you know love or peace or or hate like he's talking about even really concrete everyday words like shovel brick you can't understand those words unless you understand the context in which they're being used um there's a picture of a lion there because something that wittgenstein said was that if a lion could talk we couldn't understand him and what he means by that is if a lion was endowed with the the, the ability to use our vocabulary our grammar that lion's life is so different from the life that we lead their context their experience is so different from everything that we know that even if they were speaking in perfect english we still couldn't really understand what they meant um so a practical example um can anyone understand what this sentence means the ham sandwich just spilled beer all over himself anyone anyone got any ideas feel if you're feeling brave feel free to come off the come off mute and explain what it might mean or what the context might be it's a slightly it's an absurd statement it doesn't make sense ham sandwiches can't spill beer um this is from a study by somebody called lakoff and what they did was um or what he did was investigated how language is used in its natural context and this is a comment made by a waiter at a restaurant and the convention in that restaurant was that the customers refer were referred to by the food items they'd ordered and what's happened in the restaurant is that a chap who ordered a ham sandwich just, just spilled beer and somebody needs to go and clean it up if you understand the context the sentence makes sense and this is a real problem or a real issue or something that i think social workers need to think about a lot and the example uh for me is uh uh, imagine a court situation. So these are this is a list of some people that are in courts, judge, lawyers, advocates, social workers, parents, children. These are all people that might be might find themselves in the courtroom. Um, this is this is a this is the arrow represents how much people might understand the language game that's going on. That's that's the the idea of um you know, how much they understand the context of what's being said and how well they can make sense of the words that are being used and the judge and the lawyers are at the top of that and the parents and the children are at the bottom this arrow represents how well the family is understood and it flips it's flipped completely on its axis the parents and the children are the people that best understand the family but they're the least able to play that language game they're the least able to um understand the context of the words that are being used and they're least able to enter into that conversation um it's not just the jargon thing though it's not just the way around where the families we work with find it difficult to enter into our world i think a lot of the time exactly the same is true as of us we find it difficult to enter into their world and understand their context and their language and the way that that they use it and this is a consistent finding within serious case reviews it's never the, the language is never the top finding or never the the issue that makes the headlines but 
I, I read quite a few for this study and it's always a theme with within them and this that quote there wherever one looks there's the sense that the message is not getting through that's from a review of the Victoria Columbia inquiry that a psychologist called Margaret Rustin did um, and she looked at how and um, just for for those who I'm, I'm sure everybody knows Victoria Columbia but just to briefly set it out it was a, a a young girl from the Ivory Coast who was brought to the UK by her great aunt was um, horribly abused and ended up dying. And there was a that was in 2000. There was a big inquiry into it. Um, and what Margaret Rustin found was that all of the professionals that went to see her got caught up in the the narrative and the words and the way of speaking that her great aunt, her abuser, had. Um, and she says that instead of being able to um, observe what was going on, social workers took on the narrative that she was talking about. So it became about something was wrong with with Victoria um, when actually something was wrong um, with, with the aunt and within the care she was being given. Um, it's really important to say that, um, that Lots of the people involved in this case, you know, the aunt, great aunt included, didn't have English as a first language. Um, and maybe in questions later, I can talk a bit about how that affects this this work, because I think it's really important for for a lot of the work that we do. Um, so. I think. The, the sort of the, the kind of second half of this presentation, I'd like to talk a bit about the the sort of practicalities you know I think uh, social workers talk all the time about these issues of of language but what might we what, like, what can we do about it um and for for me I think there's massive massive value in having meaning making conversations um and those are those conversations and we have all had these and we all do them um often and i think you know them by the way they feel they're the ones where you come away from a session with a child or with a family and you feel th that both sides understand each other better you the social worker i like i go away feeling like i understand the family a bit more and i also feel as i walk out of the house that they understand me and where i'm coming from um and I think those conversations are important because it means probably that we've used less jargon and people don't feel excluded. It probably means that we understand in more depth and more detail what's going on with that family. But also, I think those meaning making conversations are a way of creating change. It's not just about sharing information. I think the, the language that we use can can help great change in the families that we're working with um, and this is what I looked into in in my research and um, just a sort of kind of brief story about about the the work that I did with a family so there was a there was a boy of eight years years old called Faisal um, and he was he had some challenging behavior and by challenging behavior I mean he would hit his mum kick his mum he would fly into tantrums and rages, break things around the house. Some of his behaviour was really quite dangerous. He'd sometimes lock his mum out of the house. So he was certainly a handful, but difficult to deal with. Um, Faisal spent time between living between his mum's house and his aunt's house. Um, and in the, the summer holidays, they had a particular massive problem where Faisal just up sticks and said, right, I'm going to live with my aunt. He stayed there for the whole of the summer holidays. His mum didn't see him at all. And she felt she had absolutely no um, control over that. So as part of my, well, my my direct work with the family was to to sit down for several sessions with, the, I brought the mum and the aunt together and we talked about Faisal. And we didn't really do anything other than talk about 
Faisal. I had my own views about, you know, what what maybe needed to happen or what they could do. But we just spoke about him and what was going on for him and what went on in the family and some of the kind of patterns of behaviour. And there was one moment, one what, what I would say was a, a meaning making conversation where the mum and the aunt suddenly said and suddenly stopped and said, you know what happens whenever Faisal wants anything, we go into fix it mode. And I said, well, what, what do you mean by fix it mode? I sort of picked up on that specific phrase and said, well, what do you mean by it? And they said, well, if he wants something, then he kicks off, he starts getting angry and everyone swings into action to make what he wants happen. And we had a long conversation about this and they had several examples and you could tell that they were getting sort of excited by this idea of fix it mode. The, the, the mum and the aunt had sort of spotted something that was going on for Faisal. Um, and we and we left it at that and I went away and I came back for the next session. And after that conversation, they'd got the family together. And they said, look, we can't have this other this situation with summer holidays where he's he's calling all the shots and we're just springing into fix it mode. They made a plan for the next holiday, precisely where he was going to be, when, which days he was going to spend with his mum and which with his aunt. Um, and they stuck to it and they said, you know what, this holiday has been so much better. It's been smooth sailing. Um, now, <laughs> I don't claim that their insight into Faisal and his behaviour is particularly um unusual but what i would say is that if i'd have gone in at the start of the process and said well you you need to set up a rotor for for Faisal and for this holiday they would have probably agreed with me but i'm not sure they would have done it i think those conversations i had with them about him about the language they were using to describe him and that real sort of interrogation of what they were saying helped them to come to that conclusion so just to finish off, I want to say something practically about, you know, I'm, I'm talking about like, meaning making conversations um, that, that I am conscious that I'm quite new to social work. I'm only two years into this to this kind of um, uh, this career. Um, I feel a bit like nervous about kind of saying what anybody else um, might want to do, but these, these are the kind of things that I, I think about when I think about having meaning making conversations. And the first thing is um, to, to balance the power. So this is, you know, social graces stuff. Um, I go in as a social worker, as a white man, as middle class, university educated. It's, it's difficult in some ways to think of somebody with more power walking into uh, a, a family. Um, and so by allowing them to speak first, asking questions, not providing my own opinions um, and always listening. I, I think it's impossible to have a conversation where people feel like they can really explore their language and what they're saying if, if we haven't first addressed the power issue. Um, second thing is prioritise other people's words. So just by um, picking up on something somebody says and then using the words that they say and asking them about it and finding out what they what they mean by it, um, it is so much more powerful. I think it's so easy to somebody will say, yeah, my um, my child gets, um, uh, I don't know, they get so um, uh, like they get so furious and then um, is a professional might come in and say well tell me about when they're dysregulated and the idea is that if you take as, as soon as you introduce your own word you're maybe creating another idea another thought or something different in their head so using their specific language that they use is really really powerful um, but it doesn't it's not just about taking what they say and listening to it. I think one of the other most powerful things that that we can do is summarise what we think. And I use summaries a lot, which comes from motivational interviewing, which is um, uh, which is referenced at the back of at the back of this. But I think 
giving people somebody to something to disagree with and saying, well, I think what you're saying is this. Um, often they'll say, no, you haven't got it quite right yet. And I think that's where really interesting information comes up. And then the, the final thing is allowing time to, to think. Um, I think that as social workers, we're, uh, you know, in, in visits where we've got tight timescales and also just generally when people say something or they're thinking about something, we, we want to kind of fill space. That allowing people to be quiet and just consider what's going on in their heads is really, really important. To go back to Wittgenstein's lion, um, he says about this lion, if it could speak, we couldn't understand him. Um, I think being a social worker is speaking to lions. I think that's what we do. Um, sometimes it literally feels that scary. Um, but I disagree with Wittgenstein. I think it is possible. I think that if a lion could speak, if we spent the time with the animal, if we really listened, if we had these meaning making conversations, then even if we can't ever understand everything about what's going on with them, um, I think we can still understand them. There are some references if anyone would like to read them and really happy to take some questions. Thank you so much, David. Um, we haven't had any questions in the chat just yet, but I'm hoping people would like to come off Mick and uh, ask any questions that they have about uh, this really interesting presentation. I can start with a comment, uh, if that's OK. If, um, just to say that just because you, you are newly qualified doesn't mean that you don't have, you're not bringing something fresh to the table. In fact, if anything, you have a unique perspective because of your background on just how important um, language is in, in terms of being impactful, because that's I suppose that's what PR and communications is all about. Um, yeah. Anybody got a question? Please. Thank you. Um, Teresa. Do you want to come off Mick? You're on mute, Teresa. Teresa, you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Oh, I just want to say thank you very much. I really, really enjoyed that. Um, my question revolves around um, the issue of silence as, as a language. You, you touched on it briefly. How do we make use of silence um, to, to create change? So you, you're working with a family, family, um, don't really engage with you or you're working with a young person, for example, uh, and you go to see this young person, the young person doesn't really say much. You know, you can sit there and end and the young person doesn't say anything. How do we work with silence? Yes, yeah. my question. That's, that's, a, that's a really excellent question. Um, and I think the. Um, so. There's so firstly, and I think we all know this, there's like a a lot to be said for just getting comfortable with discomfort. So being prepared to sit there for, um, you know, for five minutes and it's quiet and nobody's saying anything. And sometimes also warming the context for that is important. And I'm thinking specifically about the kind of idea of a, you know, a, a child, maybe a teenager, that's often the thing who won't say anything. But saying that it seems like you're, you don't want to talk at the moment. So we're just going to sit here for a while, if that's OK. And if anything does come up, you can say it, but you don't have to. That's up to you. And if you can get into that, it's actually quite a good space to be because firstly just because they're not saying anything doesn't mean they're not communicating there's a huge amount going on in terms of in terms of body language um in terms of maybe any kind of you know glances what are they fiddling with do, how do they appear are they kind of anxious nervous it, all of that kind of stuff it's also like we we barely get arrested as social workers five minutes to kind of think about what might be going on for this young person while you're sitting there with them is never time wasted so embrace the silence. Thank you. Um, can we hear from Siobhan? She's had her hand up for a while and um, I'm aware we've got five minutes left. I'd like to get in more than one question. Thank you, Teresa. Oh, OK, um, my question probably isn't that great, but I'm about to do my um, action research as well because I just started my second year in front and I'm really interested in language. But I was just wondering how the families kind of met you with 
knowing what you were kind of working on with them and what they thought about communication as well did they did you share any of your ideas with them did they feel excited or do they agree with you that communication is so powerful or that it was something that was becoming coming between them and their relationships with social workers basically I just want to know how the families kind of met yeah. you yeah. on your research topic yeah so I think so I only did this research with one family um there's a whole load of stuff to be said about action research as a model and and um you know how much you can take from one family but actually I think in this case to get into depth with that one family was really really worthwhile um in terms of how they met me generally in in terms of enthusiasm I think you worry a lot about sort of saying to a family I'm going to be doing research with you or you know would you consent to that They're absolutely fine couldn't have been more relaxed and I think we worry a, a lot more about that than families do um and as part of the research I did um I did a questionnaire with them towards the end about how they'd found the experience um and they both mum and aunt felt unusually listened to compared to other social workers they felt like I'd really taken their kind of points of view on board so in terms of the sort of relational aspect like doing the research and doing this research helped build a better relationship I think with the family and, and that's I think what they think too. Okay. One Thank last you. question Thank you so much, Siobhan. One last Thanks. question before we go from Emily Moon. She says, I was wondering if you could talk more about working with families where English is a second language and we've got three minutes before we have to go. Yeah, so so, so I, I do this a lot. So I work in Tower Hamlets, so it's an incredibly diverse um, uh, community here. And so I do a lot of work with interpreters. I thought about this question before and honestly, I haven't Got a good answer for it yet? I would. I did something that I would like to do more research on. I, I think the um, the having interpreters does hamper this, and I think it's a real problem. I think in terms of um, sort of accessibility for the families we're working with and their ability to engage with us, I think a lot does get lost. Um, but um, that doesn't mean it's that doesn't mean it's impossible to do all of the same principles apply in terms of um, you know uh, being curious balancing the power allowing like picking up on on specific things that people that people say um, and you know allowing allowing for silence all of that stuff can still be done um, but it is it is difficult for both social worker and family when an interpreter is there to be really sure and I'm not sure precisely how you solve that. Maybe, maybe that's an area for further research on the because it's kind of an impediment. I'm really sorry to say that we've got two minutes left and um, I'm not sure we've got time for another question. Somebody's put a comment in the chat about how useful this is and how they're thinking, how they're not thinking more a little bit more about you know the use of language and maybe sometimes we hide behind it so that's one of the comments from the chat just thanking you for your presentation um, and I'd just like to say thank you so much it was really enjoyable